Hello, everyone. I'm here today with my Roman Catholic friend. And as you've seen in the last video, I challenged this uh, monstrous heretic called Sam Shimon, but he would not respond. He would not take up the challenge. Instead, he would go, you know, after people who in, in the comment section and challenge them to a debate. And when they ask them that they are not ready to debate him, but uh, somebody who is more of an expert whom they know would debate him. He then uh, skips that and wants to insist to debate him. So it seems that he wants to go after people whom he believes, and this doesn't say that, but that the person in the comment doesn't know how to debate, but from his perspective, he's clearly showing that he's a coward, a complete and utter coward who goes only after people whom he thinks that he can handle. This is becoming a complete joke. Shame on you, Sam. If you're listening to this, shame on you. But like I said, we're going to expose you today on your monstrous heresies. Like uh, we're going to start with uh, Sola Scriptura. Uh, but after that, I'm going to go a little bit into, you know, faith alone as well. I'm going to address that. And um, I'm just going to touch upon that because I already made a video. This is mainly to expose you on Sola Scriptura. So I'm going to hand it right over to my friend here, uh, Jay-Z. Jay-Z, go right ahead. Yes. The floor is all yours. Yes, good day. Uh, good day to all of you. It's uh, The time now is 12.31 a.m. here in, in the Philippines. So, yes, uh, yes, it's true. I was raised uh, Roman Catholic when I was born, and until now, I'm still practicing Roman you know, Catholic. Yes. So, so um, I, at first, I didn't... Uh, I, I, at first, I didn't understand well about the uh, scriptures until uh, until um, un until I started listening to to, to the documentaries about uh, Judaism, like uh, like Ted Pike's uh, a Ted Pike's documentary, The Other Israel. So that uh, that 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 gave me such an interest to be part of the apologetics team, especially uh, Judaism, and and currently. I'm. Uh, I also have my own apologetics page group, I, and I manage my own uh, my own apologetics team. And uh, I made some few articles about uh, about Islam and uh, Judaism, so exposing the false teachings of Islam and Judaism, particularly uh, rabbinic Judaism. Now, going back to our main topic uh, today about exposing Sam Shimu. Now, now to uh, to make it clarified. Let me clarify you to all those who list who are listening right now in this uh, in, in this uh, streaming. Um, this is not uh, this is not about shaming Sam Shamoon. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, first of all, uh, I have uh, I have a respect for for Sam Shamoon about his apologetics work against Islam because uh, he was because he's very good. He's very good at at exposing the, the false doctrines of Islam, especially the the most ridiculous teachings of of the prophet of Islam named Muhammad. Okay, and uh, however, the, however, um, a few months ago, a few months, a few months ago, I I, I forgot uh, how many months was that. Uh, I started following Sam Shimon's page on Facebook. So so yes, so so yes, I learned I learned something from him about uh, about politics. Against uh, Islam, proving that Islam is indeed false, proving that Islam teaches lots of lots of frivolous things from the Quran and the Hadith, but also the, but also when uh, uh, so suddenly suddenly my respect for Sam Shimon started to diminish in a way that um, in a way that he he started endorsing. Uh, uh, <laughs> Or praising praising other other preachers who are who are actually very aggressive with the likes of uh, Stephen Anderson, Stephen Anderson, and uh, and uh, in the past few months he, he he's uh, he's in conflict with uh, James White regarding uh, the interpretation of scriptures, especially a critique a, a critique about Islam, uh, and um, okay so so here's a good here's the interesting part. Which, which somehow made me lose my respect 
for Sam Shamoon is that um, is that uh, uh, Sam Shamoon posted some few articles about uh, the the Sola Scriptura. Uh, he he actually uh, he actually supported Sola Scriptura, uh, meaning the meaning scripture only. However, I made uh, I made some bun bunch of comments, which actually came from the Bible. My basis from the Bible, uh, even though I did not, I did not put the uh, the, the biblical verses, but uh, I, but uh, my my point is this: I put some I put in the comment section of his uh, post about uh, Sola Scriptura is that uh, I, I I quoted our Lord Jesus Christ never practiced Sola Scriptura. In fact, Jesus practiced both Scripture and tradition. Why? Because because uh, because Jesus also followed the tradition of, of Passover, especially uh, especially unleavened bread, which we are going to we are going we are going to unpack later in this uh, in, in this debate or even discussion. All right. And uh, uh, however, uh, however, what Jesus only the condemned the kind of tradition is the traditions of the elders, which of course, which of course. Uh, which of course these these tradition these traditions came from the Pharisees, uh, and uh, I later found out through the through the history of, of Judaism, especially in the Talmud. The Talmud actually uh, actually admits that uh, that uh, the the traditions practiced today from the Jews, especially from the Talmud. That's uh, that's actually come from the Pharisees, and according to the Jewish Encyclopedia. Uh, the, Ju the Judaism today of the Jews is not based on the, it's not based on from Moses. It's based of, of the it's based from the Pharisees. That's why that's why they call it Phariseeism. So so uh, so with with that being said, uh, I with that with, with that comment, it, that triggered uh, that triggered Sam Shamoon a lot. That triggered Sam Shamoon. And then he started, uh, and he started becoming very aggressive, like like he was telling me, "I'm going to demolish, uh, I'm going to demolish your your argument. I'm going to decimate your 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 argument here." And uh, and, and I, I and I, I, I and I want you to come here and, and have a debate with me, and I'm going to use you as a as a guinea pig in the, in my in my stream. In my streaming, in fact, uh, I I think Sam Sam Shamoon already posted something on the on his YouTube YouTube channel about Sola Scriptura, but for me, uh, but for me in my in my case, uh, not only I was disappointed, not only I was very sad when he said when he said that uh, when he said that to me on, on the comment section, but also the, uh, but also. I'm actually, I actually did not burden myself from his, uh, from his attack, from his aggressive behavior. Why? Because I'm truly convinced that um, the uh, Sola Scriptura is not really biblical. Sola Scriptura is indeed not biblical. But also, because, because, uh, because we we cannot, we will never understand how the Jews practice, how the Jews practice Passover without uh, without tradition. So if we if if we are only relying on scripture only, what is only written, then some some people might have doubts about it. Maybe maybe this maybe this is a, only a word of mouth. But no, there 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 should be there should be a, there there should be something to back up the the scripture. That is by by the practice of tradition. That's why the, that's why I like I said I am not very burdened. I'm not bur I, I don't feel burdened at all. Why? Because I'm surely convinced that uh, that, 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 that scripture, the, the scripture and tradition, uh, go together. In order to understand, uh, in order to understand the scripture, in order to stand, in order to understand history, and and especially what what leads. Uh, what everything leads to, to to the new tradition we receive from from our Lord Jesus Christ today. Uh, yet, uh, yet, uh, yet, as for the case of Sam Shimon, I, I feel very sad. I, I feel very, I, I I felt disappointed, and I felt I lost my respect uh, for him because uh, because of, uh, of because.
because of this kind of uh, attack towards me. And then he and then he continues on blasting me about about uh, I'm going to I'm going to expose uh, I'm going to decimate your your tra your traditions of men. He was referring to to the teachings of the Catholic Church, especially about the assumption of Mary, the infallibility of the Pope. He he go he, he goes uh, he goes attacking him, uh, to our to our Catholic he, he goes attacking our Catholic faith. However, my art what. what what I presented in the argument in the in, in the comment section was about Jesus condemning the traditions of the elders of the Pharisees. I I, I made a strong point there, and uh, one one time uh, and one time I, I asked uh, I asked some 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 of Sam Shimon's followers about about Jesus and the tradition. I, I asked them one time. I asked them one time. Was Jesus really uh, was Jesus really against tradition in general? I I don't uh, I didn't I didn't receive a a proper answer from one of Sam Shimon's followers, if I if I remember correctly. But uh, but the point here is um, the point here is uh, Sam Sam Shimon went into a, an aggressive mode. So if if anyone I notice if. Uh, if I if I give my if I give my proof to Sam Shamoon that uh, Jesus indeed practiced both scripture and tradition, he would uh, and uh, and as long as it, your your valid argument doesn't agree with with his argument, he would uh, he would uh, he would uh, he would go right at you in, in an aggressive approach. He would he would even blast at you in uh, in. Uh, in a humiliating way, by by mentioning you in his uh, in his uh, in his program or in his own show, which for me, to be honest, I find it inappropriate. It's very inappropriate. So he should have uh, he should have discussed with me in in a in a very gentleman manner, in a in a friendly manner, uh, in a or the, or at or at least try to be uh, the, try to be very civil to, to be civil or professional whatever but no all he did was all he did was he did it in an in a very aggressive approach that's why that, that's why I felt I felt sad about I felt sad about this I felt disappointed and especially I lost a little bit of respect for for Sam Shimu. When it comes to it, when it comes to Islam, refuting Islam, yes, I, uh, yes, I also, I, I also, I also have my respect for him. But in terms of in terms of Christian doctrines, like shaming someone because because someone did not agree with uh, agree with his argument, uh, as long as it is valid, no, he he would go, he would he would be uh, he would be in an aggressive mode. That's all I can really say about my previous experience with Yusachi Moon, especially on social media. That's all. All right, brother. Yeah, pretty much spot on. I mean, I would, of course, uh, I completely have cut off uh, Sam Shimon from my list. I, I mean, I have lost uh, all respect for the guy because he didn't even, like I said, I challenged him to a debate and he wouldn't take it. Now, before you go to the verses, brother, uh, or before you go to the verses uh, about the um, um, uh, uh, Sola Scriptura, I would like to say the following, and that is, even logically speaking, even if you didn't have any passage in the Scripture at all that touched upon that it's not to be followed alone, we can still logically deduce that sola scriptura is unreasonable and untenable. For example, let's look at the grammatical rules and the history in which the Bible is written. If we do not infallibly know the history, the historical context, or the grammatical syntax and the rules in the language in which it was originally written, how can we get an infallible message? So then what's the point of having an infallible scripture because the whole idea of the scripture being infallible is the message to be infallible, not the writing. I mean, that's completely meaningless. You know, 
you mean to say an arrangement of letters in a certain way is infallible? That doesn't make any sense. That that's absurd. So the infallibility obviously pertains to the message. And the message is not just the writing on paper. The message is the meaning of that writing. Is the grammar behind it. And obviously scripture does not have its own dictionary. Doesn't define its own meaning. So if you do not have though the infallible meaning or interpretation of the scriptures or the relevant verses at the same time as you have those verses, the message is still fallible. And scripture, first of all, scripture being infallible then becomes meaningless unless you want to talk about the ink. The ink is so perfect. The atoms are so perfectly arranged. Okay, fine. Then we have that as an infallibility, but not even Protestants will claim that. They will say, that, no, it's the message that's infallible. Yeah. But the message cannot be infallible unless the grammar is also infallible. If you have fallible grammar, but infallible arrangement of ladders in any way, shape, or form together, you will still not get an infallible message. You will still get a fallible message. They both have to be infallible at the same time in order for the whole package to stand as an infallible message. And that's the problem right there with Sola Scriptura. Same with the historical context. If you don't know the historical context in which something is said, then it becomes ambiguous. And again, the message is fallible. Because then you have to guess. You have to say, oh, maybe this is the case. Maybe this was. You have to speculate about the history and then interpret the verse in accordance with that speculation, which again leads to a fallible, not an infallible message. So again, it is then superfluous or meaningless, rather, to call scripture infallible. The message again not being so. Now, with that being said, uh, uh, Jay-Z, uh, go right ahead. I'm going to put you on the screen and then you can uh, go through those couple of verses and explain why they utterly uh, decimate Sola Scriptura. Okay. Okay, let me uh, th let me start at uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 17. So that, uh, so that people ha will have the idea uh, how Sola Scriptura is getting de debunked or or proven, uh, proven false. So let's start with uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 17. Here's a very good example of, uh, of, of, uh, the, of a chapter, the, uh, of a chapter from the Torah of the Jews or the, or the book of Exodus in our Bible today. So this is a very good example of, of scripture and tradition. So not only it is written down, but also it was also practiced by by the Israelites, especially the Jewish people. That, that's why until now, we notice some of the Jews today are still practicing unleavened bread. So let's start reading Exodus chapter 12, verse 17. Okay. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. So notice, uh, so so notice what M Moses commanded. Come. So what he was he was saying there is, is that uh, this ordinance is going to be passed down for 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 generations of Israelites, from one generation to the next generation to the next generation and to the next generation. Okay, let's let's continue reading. Okay, in the first month you are to eat bread made without yeast and from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day for seven days no yeast is to be found in your houses and anyone whether foreigner or native born who eats anything with yeast in it must be cut off from the community of israel eat nothing made with yeast whether you live you must eat unleavened bread. Okay, so so right there, so so right there, Moses made a made very made very clear specific uh, or, or ordinance for for the Israelites uh, concerning the, the celebration of the unleavened bread, and uh, and going back to uh, and going back to the to the previous verse, uh, Exodus. Chapter 17, he says, celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for generations to come. So what does that mean? 
so so this kind so this kind of so this event the unleavened bread is going to be passed passed uh, passed down uh, one generation of of Israelite to the next until to the Jewish people even the even the even when the Jews were in exile in Babylon they still celebrate unleavened bread and thus so so since so since there is a passing of passing off the ordinance from one generation to to the next generation and thus tradition was born that's how moses commanded the, the tradition so so some some protestants or even or, or even evangelical christians may argue well it's already written there it's already written there so so why do you need tradition for it doesn't make any sense because uh, because we need because we need to in, in, interpret how how Moses commanded this kind of or this kind of ordinance. That's why that's why if we if we look at the Jews today, they're still celebrating the Passover, even though even though especially the celebration of unleavened bread, even though even though these ordinances are uh, already obsolete. Uh, Hebrews chapter eight verse thirteen. Okay. Hebrews chapter eight verse thirteen. So, if you are going to read that verse, uh, if you have time, but uh, but the point here is, it the point here is, the Israelites interpret this command of Moses. That is that is they also do they they also they they also do they they eat they eat some bread with no with no yeast. That's why that's why every year they keep on celebrating unleavened bread. The, even the Jews until now they're still celebrating unleavened unleavened bread that's their way of interpreting what the scripture says but that be, that becomes part of their uh, their their upbringing their, their their culture it was passed down from generation to generation so therefore so so therefore since since the our dictionary states that tradition is uh, is a is a culture is a is a learned culture passed down from generation to generation Therefore, it, it's very clear in this verse. It's very clear in this verse that uh, Moses commanded a lasting ordinance for generations to come, which later, it, which later became tradition. Right? Which later became tradition. Okay. So, 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 to, so to prove my point to Sam Shamoon, to, to Mr. Sam Shamoon, uh, uh, to prove my point against him. So, uh, here is. Uh, the, the reason why I told I I told Sam Shemun in my comment section that Jesus did not practice sola scriptura. Jesus actually practiced both scripture and and tradition. Of course, of course, we know Jesus knew the Torah. We can even if you if we even if we are going to ask our Lord Jesus Christ right now, uh, a Lord. <laughs> Uh, Lord, uh, where can I find the, the the chapter of unleavened bread? Of course, Jesus knows that, and, and of course, Jesus also observed the festival of unleavened bread. Matthew chapter twenty six verse seventeen. I'm going to read it for for all of you. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, "Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat a Passover?" Okay, so it is very clear in so it is very clear in this verse. So not only Jesus is going to celebrate Passover, he's going to to celebrate unleavened bread. Yes, so the bread which he will give, which he will give his two apostles, and according to our apostolic traditions, both Catholics and Orthodox alike, uh, Jesus gave bread to his to his disciples uh, to his disciples. Uh, eat as uh, all of you, where this is. Uh, my body, which will be given up for you, and uh, and until now we still follow this. We still follow this uh, 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 an apostolic tradition. To, to when whenever whenever we eat uh, whenever we eat the, the bread, we proclaim the the death of our Lord uh, until He comes. Whenever we proclaim, whenever we eat. The, the bread and and drink and drink wine we proclaim the death of the lord until he comes so that with that being said it is very clear not not only jesus gave us uh gave us an apostolic tradition he handed this oh he handed this over to 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 the apostles even to saint paul and then the apostles 
And then the apostles later passed on the apostolic tradition of, of bread and wine to, to, to Gentile Christians, such as in the Corinth, the people in the Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, where St. Paul says, I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. So, so it's very clear in this in this verse, Saint Paul never never actually teaches uh, the the people of Corinth, the Gentile Christians, to to to, to focus on Scripture alone. No, no. The, in fact, uh, in fact, we see Saint Paul. Saint Paul was very was very overwhelmed with joy. Why? Because because the Gentile Christians in Corinth were able to keep uh, uh, keep the traditions not just uh, not just they learned from scripture or from gospels but also traditions which St Paul handed them all hand hand the uh, handed over to them now the, now there is also a similar verse but this time people people in Thessalonica they so then chat Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings or traditions we pass on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. Again, it is very, very clear. Apostle St. Paul passed down, passed down the apostolic traditions to Gentile Christians. Again, similar to our traditions, we read do we do until now like like offering the bread and wine if we eat, if we eat if we eat the bread and drink the cup we proclaim the death of the lord until until he comes it's very very clear again saint paul says in in this verse second thessalonians chapter 2 verse 15 he, he tells the people oh the Please, uh, please hold on to the teachings or traditions we uh, we uh, we taught you. He, Saint Paul, never said here, uh, never saying, never said here that that, uh, that the people of Thessalonica or the people of Corinth should adhere only to only to Scripture or only to what is written on Scripture. They need, of course, of course, of course. We we all know that the people in Corinth and Thessalonica. They also, they also practice these these traditions which Saint Paul which Saint Paul tells them. So in other words, they were able to re they were able to interpret what Saint Paul handed over to them, either by word of mouth or by letter. That is by doing by doing the these uh, tra the, doing these traditions. So it's very clear and it's very evident. Solo scriptura is indeed unbiblical, and also. I also challenged uh, I also challenged uh, Sam Shemun's followers one time uh, to prove the, to to give a to, to give us a proof that uh, that uh, that the Bible says Scripture is the only rule of faith and practice. Uh, however, the, however, not not one of them not one of them provided uh, proof. Unfortunately, unfortunately speaking, and. Um, <clears throat> And uh, the and uh, I and I also noticed uh, some some evangelical Christians, especially Protestants, they keep going back to the uh, sec second letter of Paul to Timothy chapter three verse sixteen. So uh, so let me so let me show let me show that verse here on the screen. Okay, this this is uh, this is apparently uh, their favorite verse. Okay. Okay, so this is their this is their uh, basis for sola scriptura. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Okay, so so but uh, but but this verse <laughs> I call it I call it the uh, Favorite Protestant verse, <laughs> uh, favorite uh, verse of Protestants and evangelical Christians uh, to justify sola scriptura. It does. It doesn't say scripture. The scripture is is sufficient. 
basically basically a scripture is is our instruction how to how to live how to live our lives as christian what is right and what is wrong right so that, that uh, that's the that's the interpretation of this uh of second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 right now so the, but but again going back to my argument not not one single evangelical uh, christian or some or one of the followers of sam shamoon uh actually actually proved uh that uh that that, that the bible says says scripture is the only rule of faith and practice is the only authority when it comes to faith and practice none uh, none so far so and and also so going back to to my point earlier uh this is where i, I told sam shamoon i told i told sam shamoon that uh the g that jesus actually condemned such kind of uh of uh, traditions these are what we call the traditions of men so let's okay i have here the the entire chapter of matthew okay so let's let's start reading from verse one so then some pharisees and teachers of the law came to jesus from jerusalem and asked why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders they don't wash their hands before they eat Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, that, that this is what we call the Korban teaching. Okay. Actually, it's in the Talmud, so you can, you can, you, you can ch check that out. They are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. Very, very clear. My my argument uh, to Sam Shimon is very, very clear. Jesus, the, the kind of traditions Jesus condemned is the tradition of the elders, the Phari the Pharisee tradition. That's why uh, that's why Jesus told them, "You hypocrites." Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Very, very clear. Very, very clear. So, so the, the tradition, so the, the tradition which the Pharisees made, the, the Pharisees made for the, for the Jews during Jesus' time, uh, has become rules. Uh, that has become rules. But uh, but they're far apart from from worshiping God, of course, of of course we can never deny the commandment of God, uh, to, to to love God, yes, and obey His commands, yes, yes. But uh, but the Jews during Jesus' time were following the Pharisees, but uh, but and, but Jesus saw their hearts, they their their hearts are far from God because they because they want to be exalted. If we if we're going to read Matthew twenty Matthew twenty uh, Matthew twenty three, uh, Jesus uh, Jesus pointed out their 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 pride that they wanted to, they they wanted to be to be highly respected that they want to be highly respected but uh, but uh, Jesus saw their arrogance that's why that's why the Pharisees tried to kill Jesus for it and uh, and we can see clearly. And we can see clearly Matthew uh, chapter Matthew chapter fifteen verses one to nine. Jesus uh, Jesus condemned in one one false swoop traditions of men. He condemned. But uh, but if we're go if you're going to ask a question, uh, uh, does Jesus uh, does Jesus? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry about my grammar. By the way. Was Jesus really against tradition in general? So my answer is no. Jesus was never against tradition in general. Matthew 20, chapter 26, verse 17. Jesus practiced the tradition of unleavened bread. Jesus even practiced uh, the, the Passover tradition. Matthew 26, verse 18. However, 
the only specific traditions with G which Jesus actually condemned, them, these are what we call the traditions of men. So if you want to know about the traditions of men, uh, read, read, I, I would uh, advise to read the Mishnah. I recommend uh, reading the, the Mishnah by Herbert Danby, and especially read the Babylonian Talmud. See for yourselves, and you will understand why Jesus condemned these uh, these uh, these kinds of traditions of uh, traditions of the elders. It's it's written there. Yes. So so to to, to give my to, to to give my conclusion. So to give my conclusion. Since our Lord Jesus Christ himself never, never, never taught his followers to rely on what is written, we also need to practice. The, he, he also practiced uh, these, these festivals, these, uh, the, the, these pass, uh, the, Passover, the Passover celebration, which was handed over to, to Israelites from generation to generation. And let's not forget, Jesus came from the tribe of Judah, right? Jesus was from the tribe of Judah, right? So that makes Jesus an Israelite, not 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 only a Jew. He's also an Israelite, right? So, so Jesus also observed the the, the celebration of the unleavened bread, especially the Passover, and uh, and according uh, and our and according to our dictionary, tradition is is a passing on a passing on of uh, culture or belief from one generation to the next. Again. That that's what we call tradition. Okay, going back to Exodus chapter twelve, verse seventeen, Moses said, "Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for generations to come." And also, very very clear. And also very very clear. Uh, and also very also very very clear. Okay. And uh, yes, and, and yes, the, these are my these are my uh, uh, arguments. So therefore, I came to the conclusion by re-examining uh, the the scripture and especially the historical background of this uh, pr of these practices of unleavened bread and Passover uh, by by the Jews, which later which which later the. Which later passed uh, passed down to us in a new in a new form of tradition by offering bread and wine by offering bread and wine uh, and, and especially the as uh, offering the bread and wine during during the mass during the, during liturgy that that, because, that that is our tradition so I have come to the conclusion after re-examining the gospels I after re-examining the 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 scripture the Torah. I have come to the conclusion, I am 100% convinced, Sola Scriptura is indeed unbiblical. It is not biblical. So not only the scripture was written down, not only the gospels were written down, but also they were reinterpreted by, they were reinterpret, reinterpreted by means of actions. How, how do they do that? How, the, how to observe these kinds of, these kinds of commands, which which pass down from one generation to our to, to the next generation, now that's now that's what we call tradition. So clearly, so clearly, scripture and tradition go together. Sola, sola scriptura is not biblical. That's my conclusion. All right, thank you very much. Very well said. There, we have a comment here, and this is very ironic. Look, look at the. The name here of this person, the Bible teaches oneness, is calling Shemun Herod. The Bible, listen, I, I'm a, a Sam Shemun is my enemy, but the oneness would be an even bigger. Let's not forget that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> look at this man. Isn't that ironic, uh, Jay Z? That a oneness would come yes. up and cause <laughs> I mean, I wish that, uh, you know, somebody who believes Trinity would come here and call him. Heretic. Now, I agree that he is a, a heretic, clear cut. But uh, this is something, man. This really is yes, something. Indeed. Always <laughs> amazes me, you know, the irony here. But yeah, so that's that. And uh, yeah, I wanted to show a couple of verses that uh, completely demolish 
uh, the idea of sola fide or faith alone, i.e., and I'm going to do that specifically from the Apostle Paul, uh, uh, from, from his epistle, because some might argue, well, the, well, the 12 apostles, they taught uh, ambiguously or not clearly about uh, faith and works. The Apostle Paul, he sealed it and made it clear that there are no more works to be done. Now, this is absolutely false. I'm going to show that. We're going to conclude with that. But these are the two main issues that we wanted to annihilate and show everyone that they are absolutely anti-biblical and unreasonable. Okay. Let me share my screen. All right. Again. Romans chapter 2 let us read together from verse 5 but after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God verse 6 who will render to every man according to now one would expect at this point for the apostle Paul to say according to his faith or perhaps even his faith alone his faith without works. What does he say instead? According to his deeds, the exact opposite. And then he continues to them who by patient appearance in well doing seek. Notice three times he emphasizes works. Patient continuance, work. Well doing, work. Seeking for glory, work. And then is an honor and immortality eternal life so eternal life itself is given to those who work and work and work it could not be any more clear than this and then he contrasts that but unto them that are contentions and uh, contentious and do not obey the truth not just lack of faith but do not obey the truth a unrighteousness indignation and wrath tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the jew first and also of the gentile but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good. Again, worketh. Jew first and also to the Gentile. So, and there's no change here. And for those hyper who may say, well, well, for the Gentiles, he changed it. That's a, another wicked heresy altogether. And then we would have expected him to say, but also, but to the Gentile, no more. For now it is faith alone. Or grace to faith, nothing like that. For there is no respect of persons. See, he even ties it to God not being a respect of persons. This is the reason why God does not do this. Right? Somebody may be out there in the deep, darker jungles. He may not know fully, you know, who God is. They respond to the grace of God that he has been given. And he too can be given the opportunity. And then, of course, his deeds will show. And this is not to say that he doesn't have to have faith in God. He has to trust God by doing those deeds. And that is where the Apostle Paul talks about faith. Because ultimately, it is the grace of God. If a person doesn't have the grace of God, or he does not work under the grace of God, but outside of it, by by believing in God, but saying, I can do these works by myself, which is just what the Jews did, then we have the opposite extreme. And that's what the Apostle Paul is going to deal with in Romans chapter 3. He's not denying works, but he's saying you have to do those works by cooperating with the grace of God. For as many have sinned without the law, shall also perish without the law, and as many as have sinned in the law, shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which shew the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. And now, this is a very significant verse. Again, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So this is the, the gospel of the Apostle Paul. The one gospel includes faith and works. Which is, by the way, also what St. James says. Unless anybody say that James is talking about justification before men. I'm going to quickly show that. I'm going to annihilate that. But before I do, I'm going to go and show for those Protestants who might claim, well, in Romans chapter 2, he's talking about, you know, hypothetically, how it should have been. 
but then he says supposedly in Romans 3 how it actually is because nobody can fulfill the law that is false because just after he got done talking about in chapter 3 Abraham how he's justified by faith and not by the works of the law which the works of the law here he's talking about old covenant works like circumcision and those works done outside of grace as I addressed earlier but he ends this chapter by saying do we then make it the law through faith God forbid yea we establish the law so it's not taken away the essence of the law the works of remain absolutely intact they are not taken away and in Romans 11 another very significant passage verses 20 I believe to 22 he warns again well because of unbelief they were broken off talking about the Jews and thou now talking about the believing Gentiles not just Gentiles but believing Gentiles and thou standest by faith right so they are having a true faith at this moment not a false faith but a true genuine faith in Christ Jesus and then he warns them be not high-minded but fear for if God spared not the natural branches take heed lest he also spare not thee very clear, but I'm going to read on. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on that fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shalt be cut off. Speaking to the individual Gentiles who have been justified, who are being sanctified, right? there is absolutely no room for any other interpretation. When it comes to St. James, let's go there. James chapter 2. Notice he says, I'm going to read from verse number 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works? And by works was faith made perfect? So, which obviously implies that without those works, the faith would not be perfect. Right, so right there you see it. And an imperfect faith is not going to save. It's a true faith, but it's not going to and you see why it's a true faith from his analogy towards the end in a moment. You see then how that by works a is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? And now watch this. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So he is likening the body to faith, not the opposite. According to the Reformed or the or these once saved, obviously Protestants who believe in eternal security, one would should, one should expect the opposite. He should have likened faith to the spirit, right? But no, he likened it to the body. Now, does a body become less genuine? Just because the spirit is not there? No. It doesn't. The body is just as much legit. It's a real body. But the body on its own is useless. And that's how St. James draws the analogy. Uh, I think there was one more passage that I wanted to look at. And uh, I hope uh, I hope you don't mind if I, oh, if ahead, I will be ahead. allowed to speak. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. I'm gonna. And uh, 
And uh, it's very interesting here, based on the history of Martin Luther. I read, uh, <laughs> I read a very interesting history about Martin Luther. That uh, it was said that Martin Luther almost, <laughs> uh, almost, uh, almost, uh, like uh, he wanted, he he wanted to have the the letter of James be removed from the. Uh, from from the Bible because uh, because he knew that that his uh, his doctrine of faith alone <laughs> uh, is going to be demolished by Apostle Saint James. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. That is true. But uh, okay, just to give them, just to give our audiences uh, a little information also about uh, Martin Luther. And uh, Martin, I also found out that uh, Martin Luther was was also labeled an anti-Semite. I read this uh, interesting book uh, about of the Jews and their lies by my, by Martin Luther. So, uh, but but again, uh, I, I'm not I'm not so sure if uh, other if other pastors from the from, from the Protestants or evangelical Christians uh, they. I'm not sure if they imitated exactly uh, Martin Luther's uh, reaction uh, in his in his booklet of Jews and their lies. But but the point here is uh, Martin Luther showed showed signs of aggressiveness uh, uh, in his uh, in his book of the Jews and their lies. Uh, believe me, I I read everything. I read co cover to cover. Uh, 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 I read cover to cover. And uh, Martin Luther had so much hatred, uh, hatred of, of the Jews, which actually speaking, uh, I, I even told my fellow Catholic friends about uh, Martin Luther. So, so I, I, even, I even taught my fellow apologists that uh, everything, did, everything Martin Luther did in, in this book of the Jews and their lies, uh, we, 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 we will not agree everything what he says there. Uh, like, like, for example, uh, Dean Luther says, oh, their, their synagogues should be burned. Yes. But, uh, and uh, for me, as a, as a Catholic, I, I am not, I, I'm not going to be in favor of burning their synagogues. Of course, and that's, their, that's their Jewish tradition. Uh, it's just that we, we follow instead what St. Paul commanded us, that... that we need to rebuke them sharply so that they will turn so that they will turn to the correct faiths. So I use St. Paul's argument instead of instead of uh, agreeing with Martin Luther. So <laughs> but again, this is an added knowledge for all of our audiences here. So okay, but anyway, but anyway, uh, let's go back to the, to the main topic about the, uh, faith alone. How faith alone uh, how the Apostle St. James almost, uh, I, I'm sorry, demolished uh, Martin, Luther, Martin Luther's argument of faith alone. So that's why he almost take out the, the letter of James uh, from the Bible, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> In fact, it's very interesting. Yeah, I found that I think this is the verse here that I wanted to highlight because notice there's another thing that becomes or should become clear from this verse. He is not making a distinction between the justification that happens before by faith and that which here happens by work. So obviously, if a man, according to the uh, Protestants, obviously faith justifies them before God. But according to St. James, then if faith justifies them before God, so must the works. Because notice, otherwise St. James would have said something like this. You see then that although by faith, a man is justified before God. By works, also there is a justification before men. Wouldn't we expect him to say something like this here in verse 24? Surely we would. Uh, right, Jay-Z? That's what we would have expected him to say. But instead he says... Yes. Yeah, exactly. But it's, what does he say? You see then how that by works a man is justified... And not by faith only. The same sense. He has not changed the sense of justification when he is talking about faith. It is very straightforward. One flowing sentence. The same line. The same sentence. Yes. 
Yes, exactly. Obvious. That's why Martin Luther wanted to take this verse out from, yeah. from the Bible. Not the whole he, book, yeah. He knew. Yeah. Yes, the, the entire, the entire, uh, the entire epistle of James. That's why. Uh, that's why he knew he was about, He was going to be demolished. Yeah. Now I'm gonna touch upon a little bit upon uh, because some say, and Sam, this is specifically for Sam, because he claims that even though he admits, ironically, he admits that all the early fathers taught uh, water baptism as the instrument of grace, he thinks the Bible teaches otherwise. I'm going to show him and everyone that the Bible absolutely does not teach otherwise. It positively teaches water being necessary. We see here, Jesus Christ says in John chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and the Spirit, now notice he does not say, uh, pro some Protestants uh, want to claim that this water over here is just talking about the physical birth, you know, the um, uh, embryonic fluid of the of the mother in the womb. That's the water that he's talking about. It's ridiculous, which we're going to show from the context that that's a complete joke. But if that were the case right here, we would expect Jesus Christ to have said, being born of water, a man must be born now of the spirit or he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Yes, exactly. And exactly. not include both so in the exception. That's correct. That he That's correct. Both Luther. in the exception. And that makes absolutely no sense. And then in verse 6, he says, one would expect him to say, that which is born of water is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. But that's not what he says. He says that which is born of the flesh is flesh. So right there, he's making a distinction in the very next verse between water and flesh. The physical birth is not water. Water is related to the new birth. Just like the Holy Spirit. We can see it right there. And then if we scroll down, I believe to verse uh, 22, it becomes even clearer. After these things came Jesus and his disciples. So after he had said this, including being, one must being born of water and the spirit, he then and his disciples, they come into the land of Judea. There he tarried with them and baptized. And John, what kind of baptism? Someone may still say, well, they're just talking about spirit baptism. And John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salim. Because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. So here's the water again. What an amazing coincidence, huh? According to these Protestants, it would be for them to create such an artificial disconnect between the water mentioned here and the water mentioned down there. It's ridiculous. You see, so the profound truth is that if you're not born of water, if you leave the water out, that's it. You can't see the kingdom of God. You can cry all you want that I have the spirit of God. I have a feeling of the spirit of God. I feel the spirit of God working in me. Or, or the spirit, even if the spirit is in a sense, because we can see on Pentecost, for example, the spirit. And this is something that the, that the Protestants will often use. So I go to that passage as well. It's Acts chapter 10. They will often use that and say, see, but the spirit over there uh, came upon the Gentiles. First, first of all, this is an exception. This is not because this was obviously the beginning. So the Gentiles, first of all, you know, they had to be uh, God wanted to give them a sign that they are also now included, not just the Jews. That's number one. But even here, we see if we go down. It doesn't leave water out at all. In fact, there is an urgency for water. And notice we see that. In verse. 47 of Acts chapter 10. Can any man forbid water. That we should not be baptized. Which have received the Holy Spirit as well as we. Now, why would there be such an urgency, especially in times of persecution, uh, Jay-Z? Wouldn't it make more sense than to say, 
But if that water baptism was just an awkward sign, oh, we can delay that for later. The spirit is already with us. No problem now, right? Why this urgency? Oh, can mean like as if they are fighting for their life to get to the water to be baptized. That makes no sense if it's not necessary for salvation. If they already have the spirit and have the forgiveness of sins, the sins have already been washed away. Would make any sense at all ever, right? You still there? Yes. Yes, yeah. I'm following. What, what do you say about that? Isn't that isn't that a profound truth? Is that very clear? If they already yes, had, it's very clear. If they already had forgiveness of sins in addition to the spirit, why the urgency to get what? If the process of justification is complete already. get the point yes yes. yes I agree I agree brother very clear that is what I'm saying and this completely annihilates this idea that water is just a or water baptism is just an outward sign of an inward working but there's more we can also go to the Apostle Paul because many by the way I'm gonna start with the verse that talks about the the washing of regeneration, which is mentioned, I believe, in Titus. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. And by the way, this this also shows us implicitly that the baptism is not a work of righteousness. It's not a work of the law. It's something else. It's a work of love. It's, it's grace. It's a grace, though, the field, you know, work, if you so will. But according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So there is a distinct there between washing and the Holy Spirit, which means this washing is not just a symbolical washing. Like Protestants want us to believe. And the, by the way, the Greek word here used is lutron, which can mean or which means a bath of water. Why did the Apostle Paul use that? Could have used many other words. To make it symbolic. But he chose that one. That means bath. And he, that he ties in in Ephesians chapter 5. With water specifically. When he talks about the church. That is sanctified. It is done so by the washing of water. As we can see. In verse 26 of Ephesians chapter 5. That he might sanctify and cleanse it. The church with the washing. Again Luton, Of water though. So he emphasizes the water very clearly. So there is no denying it. And this is the this is the irony, by the way, uh, JC. The, the what the Protestants will do, often a time they will make what is uh, to be taken literally. They will make it purely symbolic, and what is taken to be symbolic, they often make it literal. The exact other way around. Like, for example, a perfect example is the, you know, in the book of Revelation, when it talks about the thousand years, the millennia, they make the number thousand to be literal. They think that Christ meant a literal thousand years. That means thousand times 365 and a quarter days, not one day less and not one day more. But that is not what was meant there. The number thousand often refers to a very large, indefinite number. In the Old Testament, it's about upon thousands of hills. Doesn't mean there were exactly thousand hills there. So, uh, and or a day of the Lord is like uh, uh, a thousand years of us are like a day for the Lord. Does that mean that there's only a thousand? No, obviously God is infinite. So everything would be in front of Him at once. He's timeless. He's outside of time. So that just means very large or infinite. Does not mean exactly 1,000, literally. So yeah, if you want to add anything to that, Jay-Z, otherwise uh, we're going to leave it at that. I think we covered the main points, but um, if anything else comes to mind, what angered you specifically when it comes to Sam Moon, let me know because that's what the what the live show was about. And anybody in the comment section, if you want to say anything about Sam Shimon, let me know. I'm going to highlight the comment. Maybe we can comment a little bit. 
you know, for the people who are listening in the chat, you know, that would be great. Otherwise, Okay, so so far I I don't have any arguments uh, to to present uh, uh, to represent uh, uh, against uh, Sola Scriptura. I believe that that my valid arguments using Exodus chapter chapter twelve verses seventeen to twenty they're they're very very clear. They're, they're very very clear. Not only not not only the ordinance and celebrations of the, of the festivals of the of the Israelites and the, Jewish people about unleavened bread and Passover were written down, written down uh, on the Torah, especially in, especially in the Bible. Jesus also, and we also came to the conclusion that Jesus not only practiced practice uh, scripture. Of course, we we definitely know that Jesus knew the, the scripture. That's why uh, that's why the, the priests, when Jesus was in the in the temple for a few days, they were very amazed of his knowledge. Ah, oh, amazing! This child knows the Torah, everything. So, yes, he knows the scripture. But but yet, if we read other verses of the Bible, such as such as Matthew chapter twenty six verse uh, seventeen. Jesus, uh, Jesus observed uh, the celebration of unleavened bread. Why? Because he, because he's a he, he because he was a Jew. He, he, so therefore, he was also an Israelite. And also, and, and and we also come to the very conclusion that Jesus was never against tradition in general. So there are certain traditions which Jesus condemned, uh, condemned, and these are what we call traditions of the elders. So again, if you want to know about for all the audiences here listening to us so i would advise i will advise or suggest that you that uh, you need to read the the mishnah the mishnah and the and the babylonian talmud all of the traditions of the elders are written there so that's why uh, that's why the jews still revere the talmud than than the torah i, I have uh, i have a very good proof of that that the Jews today observe the Talmud than, than the Torah, that is the traditions of the Pharisees, than 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 Moses himself. So, and and uh, and also about sola fide, it's very very clear. Even apostles apostle Saint Paul also emphasizes that uh, we should also do we should also do like seeking glory, uh, 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 moving moving oneself away from immorality and and and. And, and do good deeds. Yes, it, yes. A man is also justified by works, not not that not only that not only by faith, but works. That's why that, that's why uh, the church fathers uh, the, the the church fathers have said that uh, faith and works must must go together. Faith and works must go together. Now, now I wish that uh, and thanks to your to your lecture on sola. On, on your on your topic about sola fide. Now now we have truly the, now we have truly debunked uh, sola fide. Uh, now hopefully this is going to be once and for all. But I don't think uh, but I don't think uh, some of, some of these evangelical Christians, especially the Protestants, will will still accept uh, our our uh, uh, Bible verses that clearly say. That uh, that that a man uh, that a man will be justified in the eyes of God through his faith and works. Yes. So so um, the, and also and also so earlier so like uh, just like we mentioned, Second Timothy chapter three verse sixteen. I, again, I call this the the favorite <laughs> the favorite verse of the uh, the Protestants. In justifying sola fide, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Sola scriptura. All scripture is God bred, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So, in other words, it gives us it gives us knowledge, but it, it never says that scripture is sufficient, and scripture is the only is, is the only is, is the only one we can turn to when it comes to faith and practice, and also uh, and also. Um, Protestants, Protestants and evangelical Christians never even prove a, a single verse in the Bible that, that that actually says scripture is the only rule of faith and practice. So exactly. 
So we don't read that kind of verse in, in the Bible. So, so again, sola fide and sola scriptura are both unbiblical. So thank, thank you very, very, thank you very much, uh, Brother Johnny, for, to, for for having me on board, and I'm and I'm and I'm and I feel great today. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jay Z. And if there's anyone in the comment section who's got any question, we'll wait for a couple of minutes, and if not, then we'll end the session here. So feel free to ask us questions in the comment section if there's any. Oh, by the way, the example, um, if you look, if you contrast uh, St. James when he talks about Abraham being justified by works, he uses Abraham's example of uh, offering his son Isaac, but the Apostle Paul uses the example of him circumcising. Now, had St. James said that Abraham sees thou how Abraham was justified also by circumcision, right, and not by faith only, then we would have to agree that yes, there may there has to be a contradiction there, or maybe he's talking about some other type of justification before men, like Protestants like to say, you know, those who believe in faith, uh, you know, in eternal security. But that's not how it is, and that is very significant. Neither does the Apostle Paul say when that Abraham was fully justified perfectly justified before he offered up Isaac. So he's not contradicting him. So that was an essential work for salvation. Circumcision was not. Because circumcision is part of the schoolmaster. That's what people don't understand. It is an old covenant work, a work of the law, as the Apostle Paul puts it. This is something that people need to understand. It did not confer grace to the individual. It just kept him secure in the land. And it, of course, it taught him to have faith because they focus more on the externities and it would remind them, just like the animals would never take away sins. Some people may have this idea of all oh, no, the In the Old Testament, the animals would take away sins up until that time, you know. And then because they sinned again, they had to then sacrifice animals again so that those sins can also be taken away. No. <laughs> the sins were not taken away at all. They were only covered. They were, people were only reminded that they had to Trust in God. Repent to God. So that the sins ultimately will be forgiven. Through Christ. And his work on the cross. That's what's so significant. And that's what's missing in the equation. Now I see there's no questions. So I guess easy we can end it here. I think we. Uh, you know addressed. The significant points here. And we can only hope obviously. Many Protestants are going to be hard headed. But we are going to hope at least that some are going to wake up after having heard this. Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening. Yes, we will continue praying. We will continue praying uh, for the Protestants that they may that their that that their eyes may be open to to the truth that sola scriptura is not biblical. And uh, and I hope uh, I really hope that uh, they would bear these verses in mind. Uh, the, the verses we presented earlier against uh, Sola Scriptura. It's very, very clear. Moses commanded the Israelites or the Jewish people to to observe to, ob to observe these ordinances, which later transform into in, into tradition. And also, Jesus Jesus himself is a is a Jew, so he also practiced. Uh, he also obeyed uh, the the Mosaic law, the the, tradi the tradition, the tradition of the Israelites. Uh, however, the, however, Jesus was never against the, the tradition in general because there are certain traditions that Jesus even condemned, and these are what we call traditions of the elders. So that's my so these are my proofs for for Protestants or evangelical Christians. I really hope that their 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 eyes may be very open uh, uh, today to uh, to. Uh, to clear proofs that uh, sola scriptura is un is indeed unbiblical. So thank you very very much, uh, brother Johnny, for having me on board. I I feel great today, and uh, and and uh, as I have mentioned, I I'm 
I don't feel any burden at all about about uh, the teaching of sola scriptura. So so there. So with with that well, with these verses mentioned. So I hope uh, I hope uh, Sam Shamoon will recognize uh, these verses or the evidences from the Bible that uh, sola scriptura is indeed debunked, just like what we did today, Brother Johnny. Indeed.